I want you to take your Bible tonight and look at 1 John chapter 5. We're going to go to a very familiar passage of Scripture, 1 John chapter 5. And while you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. So listen carefully. And I want you to really think about this question tonight. Do you ever find yourself doubting your salvation? Do you ever find yourself doubting whether or not God is going to hear your prayer? We, we have been talking much about faith over the course of the last several months. We've just went through the whole fruit of faith and what it means to depend and rest upon the Holy Spirit and let Him develop in us through our dependence on Him the fruit of the Spirit. And as Christians, we must be bearing fruit. But I will tell you that many Christians are complacent and they're content to live in the state that they're in. They're not growing. And I will tell you, eventually, a Christian who is in that state for any length of time will begin to doubt. They'll begin to doubt their relationship with God. They'll begin to doubt whether God is answering their prayer or whether they even know the Lord. And doubt is such a damaging place for a believer to dwell and so today, we want to destroy doubt. We want to put doubt down. We want, to be, we want to deal a death blow to doubt. And this is a very familiar passage of Scripture, and I want to read it for you. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe. He said, I'm writing this to you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Why? That ye may know that you have eternal life, why? And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, the Christian life is a life of faith. We enter into the Christian life by faith. We're, we're saved by grace through faith. God gives us grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. He gives us all of his favor and his blessings and all of that in exchange for our faith. We come to him with simple trust, and, and, uh, and belief. And Jesus said that there, were, there was a place that he went to his hometown and he could not do any mighty works there because of their unbelief. He could not commit himself to them because they would not commit themselves to him. They wouldn't believe on him. And, and so the exchange in heaven is the exchange rate of faith. We put faith into the Lord Jesus Christ, we get saved. We put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for, uh, for strength, for help, for joy, for peace, for blessing, for power, for all the things that we need in the Christian life, and he answers in return. And so faith is the key. And so John wrote this book, and he wrote these things to people who already believe on the name of the Son of God, so that they would know that they have eternal life, and that they might continue to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would continue to walk in faith. We walk in Christ as we receive Christ. By the same measure of faith that we receive Christ is how we walk out in Christ. You always, as a Christian, are going to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Now, this, this text was written basically as a death blow to people who say, well, you cannot know for sure that you're saved. Listen, this is where all of the, the foundation of the Christian life comes from. If we don't have assurance that we're saved, we're not going to live as the saints of God as we ought to be, and we're not going to live with a powerful faith and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. So God gave these verses to save people because it is not only possible for a saved person to doubt their salvation, but it is absolutely probable that saved people will come to a place to be tempted to doubt. A Christian can know that he is saved. A Christian that he can know that God is hearing his prayer. Look at verse number 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him. See, he, John is writing to the believer here about confidence, about faith, about assurance. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So listen, 
I don't. I won't believe God is hearing the prayer I've prayed today, for whatever it may be, if I can't have assurance in my heart that God has heard me when I prayed and received Christ as my Lord and Savior. So hey, he's wanting us to know that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So listen, here's what John is saying. John is saying, you can know that you're saved, you can know that you're being heard in your prayer, and you can know that God is going uh, to never disown his own, that God is going to always uh, keep you and bless you and hear your prayer. Now, this is important. And why is it? Because Satan is always using doubt as a major weapon. The very first words recorded on the pages of Scripture that Satan ever asked to man was the question, Yea, hath God said that ye shall not eat of every tree that is planted in the garden? Now listen, he immediately came in and he didn't say, Hey, God didn't say you can't do that. He said, Did God say that? And he planted a seed of doubt. Once he got Eve to struggle with the doubt, then he came in with his own accusation of God, ye shall not surely die. And then he changed the word of God completely and he moved man away in unbelief. The sin of Eve in the Garden of Eden was a sin of unbelief. The sin that sends people to hell is the sin of unbelief. The sin that keeps Christians from being sanctified is the sin of unbelief. Paul wrote, he said, I wrote these things uh, that you would purify your hearts by faith. Listen, you'll never live a sanctified, pure life if you're not living a life by faith. Listen, faith is everything. And so that's why John is writing this book, because Satan is a purveyor of doubt. And if he can get Christians to doubt, he can move them away from their trust in Christ, their trust in the Word of God, and he can then eventually subtly slip them away into a place of unbelief. And our prayers go unasked. Listen, the great problem is not the problem of unanswered prayer. The great problem is the, is the problem of unasked prayers. We have not because we ask not. It's not that we're asking and God's not answering. It's quite simply, most of the time, we're not asking. And we're not praying, and we're not praying in faith. We're not praying in trust and full dependence and assurance upon God and his word and his character and his promises. Uh, think about how Satan is a purveyor of doubt. His first question to Eve, yea, hath God said. Let's fast forward to the New, Test New Testament. Jesus is taken into the wilderness after his baptism to be tempted of the devil. And the first thing the devil comes to him and says is, if thou be the son of God. Now this is right on the heels of the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ, where the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. And the father said from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That announcement had just been declared by the Father. The anointing of the Holy Spirit took place. Jesus is now in the wilderness, and the first thing the devil comes and says is, if you are the Son of God. Do you not see how Satan is so subtly working in doubt? And if he can get believers to doubt God, and to doubt their beliefs, and then to believe their doubts, Christians will be rendered ineffective. And I will tell you, many believers have struggled with doubt. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus was dealing with the father there, and that father uh, needed the Lord to help him with his son. And Jesus, he said, Lord, if you can. And Jesus said, no, 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 it's not if I can, it's if you can believe. And the man said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And here was a man struggling with doubt. Uh, I think of John the Baptist. The man who boldly proclaimed, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And then eventually John is arrested. He's in prison. He's about to be beheaded. And John sends for his disciples and says, You go find Jesus of Nazareth. And you ask him this question. Are you really the one? Or should we look for another? What was John doing? He was in a moment of turmoil. He was in a moment of tribulation. And John began to doubt. Uh, believers doubt. Believers doubt. It sounds odd to say that a believer will doubt. But Satan wants a believer to doubt because the power of the believer is in faith 
in God and in his word. I think of Thomas. Thomas doubted. Except I put my hands in his wounds and thrust my hand in his side, I will not believe. I must see to believe. He doubted. Peter doubted. Uh, Jeremiah doubted. Jeremiah became so dismayed by the hardness of the people's heart that Jeremiah said, I don't think that I'm actually even called to this ministry. And he bailed on the ministry. And so what I'm simply saying is this. Believers, one of our great hazards in the Christian life is doubt. The sin of unbelief will move us into the sin of everything else. We live by faith. We stand by faith. We walk by faith. We're called to be people of faith. And so Satan is going to try to do all that he can to get us to doubt. Now, what is doubt? Doubt is simply to lack confidence in or to consider something unlikely. To lack confidence in or to consider something unlikely. You know, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. I, I don't know that maybe I didn't pray the right thing. Maybe I didn't feel the right feeling. Maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't uh, really believe like I should. And we begin to lack confidence. Or uh, I, I prayed, but I don't know that God will really answer that prayer. I, it's really unlikely that God would hear my prayer. And see, these are all the things that shake our faith and make a believer live in doubt. Doubt is always the devil's doing. Doubt is a temptation. Uh, Zechariah doubted that God was going to give him a child. And he was struck dumb until Elizabeth was delivered. And then he was to name the child John. And when he called for that pen and he wrote his name, called his name John, and God unleashed his tongue. And why was he in that way? He was rendered dumb and he could not speak because he had doubted God. Uh, Abraham and Sarah doubted. Abraham staggered in serious unbelief into Hagar's tent and really, really created chaos on this planet. Sarah doubted and laughed in disbelief. And she had to have a son named Isaac, whose name means laughter, to remind her to believe God. Believe God. That God will turn your laughing of doubt into a laughing of faith. Uh, and so... Doubt is Satan's doing to get people away from the power of walking in faith with God. Doubt is not good. Doubt is not good. Uh, but I will tell you, there is a positive side to doubt. Doubt is to your spirit what pain is to your body. Did you know what pain is to the body? Pain is something that is a warning signal. It's a check engine light. It's to say to you, hey, there's something wrong here. You need, to, you need to work on this. You need to relax that. You need to take this easy. You need to go get this fixed. Pain in the body is a warning light that something is wrong. Well, doubt is to the spirit what pain is to the body. Doubt says, hey, spirit, there's something wrong here. Spiritually, we better do a checkup. That's why John wrote this book, so that we could walk in assurance. Now listen, if you feel pain, it's because you're alive. And if you feel doubt, it signals that there is spiritual life, but there's a spiritual problem. Something is wrong in your spiritual life, and you need to deal with it. And that's a warning light that says you need help spiritually. So if you're a believer who has been saved, but you are prone to doubt, there's something wrong spiritually. And you need to get back in the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Get back in the Word of God. Let God rebuild and shore up your assurance so that you can walk boldly in faith. I remember reading a story. A lady came to D.L. Moody, that great evangelist, back in the 1800s in Chicago. And a lady came to Mr. Moody and she said, Pastor, I have never doubted my salvation not one single time. And Moody said, well, then I doubt that you have ever been saved. And, and, and what was he saying? It's just very common for people to doubt their salvation. That's why John wrote this book. John wrote his gospel as an evangelist saying to sinners, I want you to believe. John wrote this book, this epistle, uh, as more of a pastor to get saints to know that they have assurance of faith in Christ. 
And so we need to walk in faith. Uh, let me give you a couple things tonight that I think will help you. Number one, if you're dealing with doubt, I want you to go back and re-examine the root of your faith. Where did our faith begin? Where did this Christian life begin? What is the root? What is the anchor point? What is that place that the Christian life began in our heart? Notice what he says in 1 John chapter 5, and look at verse number 6. Verse number 5 says, Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Now listen, there's a great victory to those who walk in faith. Notice back in, uh, notice back in verse 1, Whosoever believed that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Okay? And then, so if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're born of God. And who is he that overcomes the world? But he that is born of God. So salvation comes by faith. Victory comes by faith. And it's imperative that we walk by faith. So how do we know? Where does this root of our faith go down? And what is it anchored to? Look at verse number 6. Speaking of Jesus, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. Now, what is, what is the root of our faith? Number one, write this down in plain uh, English so that you can remember it. Number one, the root of our faith is the work, the finished work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The finished work of Christ. In John chapter 19 and verse 34, Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. He didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. He finished the work and he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. Now, what did he finish? He finished the work of redemption. He finished the work of salvation. I do not need to doubt my salvation because of the finished work. Look at this, look at it again, verse six. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. Now, why did he emphasize this? What does this mean, this water and blood? He's talking about the finished work of Jesus Christ. Go back with me to Calvary. And remember, when that spear was thrust into the side of the Lord Jesus Christ, after he gave up the ghost, he commended his spirit to the Father, Cry with a loud voice, it is finished. He bowed his head. He gave up the ghost. When they came to him, they saw that he was dead. They didn't break his legs to fulfill the prophecy that not a bone should be broken. But they thrust the spear into his side. And out of his side flowed blood and water. It was such a remarkable act. It was such a remarkable thing that the centurion who pierced him in the side hit his knees at the foot of the cross and declared, truly, this man was the Son of God. I mean, water and blood. Now, what does that mean? Let's take a trip back, back, way back in the Old Testament to the establishing of the tabernacle. In the tabernacle, when you came through the door of the outer court of the tabernacle, the first thing that you came to was the altar. That's where the blood was shed. And, and the sacrifice was made, and the blood was shed, and the sacrifice was consumed upon that altar. And then the next piece of furniture you came to was the laver. The laver was a, vet, a, a, was a, a, a thing with, a, with mirrors in the bottom of it and water in it so that you could wash your hands and your face and your feet. And then the priest carried on into the tabernacle, lighting the table, uh, lighting the candlestick, the table of showbread, lighting the altar of incense, and then he would come back out, but not to the altar. He would come back out to the laver where he would wash again and then go back in and present the blood at the mercy seat. Now, what did all that have to do? It has to do with the finished work of Jesus Christ. That the blood that Jesus shed at the cross speaks of the blood that bought our redemption. That blood was the purchase price that paid the penalty of sin. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Only by the shedding of blood comes the remission of sins. So when Jesus shed his blood, he was paying the price. We were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. That was the price that he paid to, to cover our sins. 
to forgive our sins. But wait a minute. But wait a minute. What is the water? The water speaks of not only did his death and his finished work have power to free us from the penalty of sin. The blood carried that and the blood took care of that. But the water speaks that his finished work also has the ability to deliver us from the power of sin. Not just the penalty of sin, but the power of sin. It has a cleansing, purifying effect. So we're not only redeemed, but we're now sanctified. We are set apart and cleansed. We're made clean and pure. Uh, the, song, the songwriter, uh, Mr. Top Lady, wrote that old hymn, Rock of Ages, and I think he said it best. He said, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Now remember what he said? Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be for sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Now church, listen. This is he who came by water and blood. Not by water only, but by water and blood. So it takes the blood of Christ to free us from the penalty of sin. But that water in the finished work of Christ speaks of his finished work purifying us and helping us to walk clean. We have Jesus Christ purchasing our salvation completely from beginning to end to present us faultless before the throne. We are redeemed and justified and sanctified and will one day be glorified through the finished work of Jesus Christ. So what is the root of my faith? Number one, the finished work of Christ. Number two, number two, the root of my faith is in the faithful witness of the Spirit of God. Look at verse number six. This is he that came by water and blood, not by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit that beareth witness because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one. There are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. Okay, so the finished work of Jesus Christ, coupled with the power and the witness of the Holy Spirit here, is a root of my faith. It's the assurance of my salvation because I have the witness of the spirit. The spirit of God witnesses on my behalf in heaven, but he also witnesses to me he witnesses for me. He witnesses to me. But he is the one who is the witness of my salvation. Now, what does all this mean? What does it mean, the witness of the Spirit? Well, how do I know who Jesus is, who he says he is? Who bears record that Christ really is, that Jesus really is the Christ? Who bears record that Jesus really did die on the cross? How do I know that something that happened 2,000 years ago has a eternal impact on my life today. How do I know that all this is true? Through the witness of the Holy Spirit. The witness of the Holy Spirit, he was sent into this world to reprove the world of their sin, to reprove the world of judgment, to bring the world into conviction, and then to show them Christ, to make known Christ to them. Listen, when you got saved, it was the Holy Spirit who made you see yourself as a sinner. It was the Holy Spirit who brought you under conviction of your sin. It was the Holy Spirit who pointed you to Jesus Christ as the finished work of Christ, and you saw Him as your only means of salvation. And you were brought to faith in Jesus Christ through the faithful witness of the Spirit. Um, how do I know that Jesus really died on the cross? The Holy Spirit makes that real in my heart. He makes it personal to me. So I'm not just believing intellectually that a man lived like Abraham Lincoln lived and that Jesus died like Abraham Lincoln died. And I'm not just believing in a story intellectually, but I have made it real. It has been personalized to me that he died for my sins and he has risen for my redemption and that I can be saved. The Holy Spirit is the witness and God gave us the spirit to witness it and make it real in our heart. Notice what he says in verse 9. He says, If you receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of 
his son. Now, what does he mean? If you can receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. What does he mean by that? Well, some people wonder, well, how do I know that this is all really true? Well, look, you do this all the time with the witness of men. You take men at their word all the time. You trust what somebody tells you. You go to the, the doctor tells you, you need this medicine. So you drive to the pharmacy. They call it in. You go there, you put, you put your card in the little box. It comes back from the pharmacy. You take a little uh, pill bottle. You can't even pronounce the, the words that are on that pill bottle, but you swallow it anyway. You, you just swallow that down because you just received the witness of the doctor and the witness of the pharmacist, and you just swallowed it down, and you took it because you believed it would help you, and you don't even know what it is. Uh, you go to the restaurant. And uh, you ask the waiter, uh, what do you recommend? Well, I recommend this. You know, I'm going to try that today. What did you just do? You received his witness. Uh, you get on the airplane and you sit down and you fly to the heavens. What did you do? You received the witness of the mechanic and the witness of the engineer and the witness of that pilot. You have never met that pilot. You don't know who that pilot is, but you just sat down and flew away. You just took him at his word. You received the witness of men. We receive the witness of men every single day, all day long. We trust other men. And if we can receive the witness of men, the witness of God is far greater. The Holy Spirit was sent to give us a witness of who Christ is, and he witnesses to us, and then he comes to live in us, and he witnesses in us. The Bible says in the book of uh, 1 John, verse number, verse number 10, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. This is what Paul said in the book of Romans, that the Spirit of God witnesses to us that we are the children of God. We have a witness in us that assures our hearts. You say, well, I don't know that I can hear that. Listen, okay, so watch this. How do we know that we're saved? Number one, the finished work of Christ. Number two, the faithful work of the Holy Spirit. Number three, through the faithful word of Scripture. And let me just say it this way. Let's say it this way, the final word of Scripture. Scripture is the final word. Look at verse number 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that has the life, the Son has life. And he that hath not the Son of God has not life. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. The final authority is the Word of God. The final witness is the Word of Scripture. So I have the finished work of Jesus Christ. I have the faithful witness of the Holy Spirit. And I have the final Word of God, the record that God gave of it. Listen, to doubt, to doubt the Bible is to, is to call God a liar. This is God's Word. And a person is only as good as their Word. Their character is only as good as their word. If I doubt this, then I'm calling him a liar because he's telling me this is true. Listen, so if the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, then whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, that's what it means. If the Bible says that he came to his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them who, who, who uh, believe on his name, that's what it means. For if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Listen, we can go over it, over it, and over it, and over it. There are hundreds of scriptures that give us assurance that God says if we believe we receive. Jesus said, he that cometh to me, I'll in no wise cast him out. Uh, if, you, if you come to him, he receives you. He puts you into his hand. He puts you into his father's hand. No man can pluck you out of his hand. He's given you eternal life. Listen, this is the word of God. And to say, I doubt that, is to say, I think God's a liar. And that's exactly what we do. We, we are calling God a liar. Now, 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 listen, this is the record that God has given us. Suppose today that I, I had to prove that I was married to Michelle, that we were actually married. And so I went down to the courthouse, and uh, I, I had to stand before a judge, and the judge says, well, tell me, 
um, are you married? And I said, yes, I am married. And, and he said, well, uh, can you prove that? I said, well, judge, <laughs> it was a beautiful ceremony. These are the colors we had in the ceremony. This is the music that was playing in our ceremony. We had all these candles lit in our ceremony. Uh, these are the people who stood with her. These are the people who stood with me. It, these are the things that we said. It was a beautiful thing. Oh, he said, yeah, but, but, but how do I know that you're married? Well, judge, listen, I, oh, you should have been there. It was beautiful. You should remember the feeling that I had. Oh, it was, it was so romantic. And I, I've never felt like that in my life. It was just such a wonderful feeling. Well, let me tell you something. All of those things are not proof that I'm married. Uh, they might be they might be reminiscent of an event, but they're not proof. Uh, I can't go back and say, "Well, judge, you should have heard the music." That's not proof that I'm I'm married, uh, or you should have known how I felt. That's not proof that I'm married, or judge, you should have heard the vows that I said. That's not proof that I'm married. Now, all those things may be factual, and they all happen. I heard that music. I had that feeling. I said those words. And that's all, that's all maybe very factual in my own life, but that's not proof that I'm saved. But if I went down to the clerk's office in that courthouse and I asked for a marriage certificate and my marriage license when we filed and they give me a copy of that and I walk back into that courtroom and I lay that document down on the judge's bench and I say, judge, on this date, this was signed by these people and these witnesses and in this state, we were declared married. Let me tell you something. The judge will say, there you go. You're married. Why? Because I gave him the record. And I want to tell you that Jesus 2,000 years ago died on the cross and he finished the work of salvation. The Holy Spirit brought it into my heart in conviction. He showed me my need to be saved. He pointed my heart of faith to Jesus Christ. I received Christ. And then he moved into my heart to give a witness in me that I belong to him. But then he gave me this word and said, this is the record. How do you know? It doesn't matter what word you said. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter if you can remember all the, all the specifics or the exact date or all that of when you got saved. The record is... If he promised that he would in no wise cast you out, that he would receive you, redeem you, forgive you, and save you, and claim you, and make you his, and give you new life, and make you born again. Listen, this is the record that God did what he said he would do. That's why John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Now listen, we have his record. This is the record. Now I'm going to finish with this tonight, and I'll pick up on something next week, but I want you to hear me. Doubt is the devil's doing, and doubt will run us all the way down to our roots, and it'll shake us, and doubt will cause us to move away and to lack power and blessing in our Christian life. And John said, I want you to know, I wrote these things to you that believe that you would know, that you would know. You need a rock solid faith. You need a firm foundation so that you know that you're saved and that you can grow in the Lord Jesus Christ and live by faith. If I can't take God at his word that he'd save me, how can I take God at his word that he'll hear my prayer? or that God will work on my behalf, or that God will give me favor and grace in areas of my life that I need it. I must come to him by faith. The just shall live by faith. Now listen, if you're not saved, I want to encourage you to be saved. Now I would just tell you this. Why is that check engine light on? Why, why are we doubting? Well, there could be a couple things. Number one, you may not be saved. You need to come back and really examine whether you're in the faith. Did you come to Christ in the way the Bible says to come to Christ in repentance and faith, trusting him to be saved. If not, to come to him tonight. So it may be that. Number two, it may be that there's unconfessed sin in your life. You have a sin that you're holding on to that you have not freely surrendered to him and confessed it to him. And for confessed it, forsaken it, repented of it. Lord, I want to be clean and free from that. That sin will separate you from God. It will not make you lose your salvation, but that sin will make you lose your fellowship and it will condemn you and it'll fill your heart with guilt and doubt. And you'll begin to wonder. Uh, Satan will begin to accuse you and you'll begin to wonder, how could I do this and be saved? So listen, if there's unconfessed sin in your life, get it right. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just 
to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number three, it may be that there is no fellowship with the Heavenly Father. Listen, you cannot know that you're a child if you don't know the Father. And so if you're not reading the Word of God, if you're not spending time with the Lord in prayer, if you're not cultivating a relationship with Him, you're going to wonder, do I really belong to Him? Where is He? You're going to have a knowledge in your head, but you're not going to know Him intimately and personally. And God saved you for you to have a relationship with Him. So perhaps there's a doubt saying, you better get back into fellowship and relationship with Him and draw close and get your heart right and let's walk in faith tonight. If you're not saved, come to Christ right now. And believers, let's get our, 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 make sure that we're rooted and grounded and that we're growing in the Lord. Father, I pray that you'll take your word tonight and may we go back and remind ourselves of what your word says about the assurance of our salvation. Doubt is not just possible in the life of a Christian. It's probable. Satan is a doubter. He's subtle. And Lord, if we do not walk in faith, we will never have victory. And so I pray that we'll get rooted and grounded in the very basics of this faith, that we know whom we have believed and are persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Everything in our Christian life flows from that assurance. So I pray that we would walk in it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.